Hello, everyone, and welcome to this live stream brought to you by us at ICERS, the International Center for Ethnobotanical Research and Education. Uh, and I'm here today with the team from the Ayahuasca Defense Fund, Constanza Sanchez, Natalia Raboyo, and Jesus Alonso Olamendi. Uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit today and just share some trends of what's going on on the ground with legal cases related to different, different plants um, from ayahuasca to others as well that are included in our program. So a lot of things are happening on the ground and it's really important to us to be able to share with the community what we're learning. So to get started, just gonna take us back in history a little ways. Um, and Constanza, you've been with the Ayahuasca Defense Fund for the longest time. Can you share a little bit about how it, how it got started, the story behind it? Um, and the origins of the Ayahuasca Defense Fund. Yes, of course. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening here in Spain and morning, perhaps, where, where you are. So welcome. And, and yes, um, just to start with uh, providing a, bit, a little bit of historical context about how all this started. Uh, as you probably know, as ICERS was funded in 2009, uh, two, yeah, 2009, and and since the very beginning, we we started to receive uh, requests from facing legal challenges in relation with uh, with psychoactive plants. Um, as you also probably know, psychoactive plants has uh, different legal status uh, all over the world, but. Uh, the most uh, common situation, and that's the case of, of ayahuasca, is that uh, ayahuasca itself is not scheduled, but DMT containing ayahuasca is, and that uh, has led to many um, law enforcement all over the world and, and policy, drug policies all over the world to, to criminalize and prosecute activities or uh, any uh, connections with, with uh, plants. So that, uh, as I was saying, since the very beginning of, of, uh, of ICR's um, um, functioning, we, we received requests of, of support from, from people facing these legal challenges. And, and um, we started to develop somehow, um, well, from with, with our resources at that moment, with our knowledge at, at this moment, we started to, to develop a, a more and more sophisticated uh, way of, of supporting these these cases. At the very beginning, it was not very professionalized, but we we very since the, since very soon we we realized that uh, these cases were increasing. So we will we yeah we 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 had to 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 professionalize and 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 incorporate new new people to the team, incorporate more. Uh, knowledge and, and resources and and that we uh, well we 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 had a very uh, important um, case in in Chile and even uh, ben Benjamin de Lunen and and Jose Carlos Bozo our well uh, executive director and scientific director at ICERS they they traveled to Chile they attended the the cases uh, Jose Carlos provided expert with witness testimony in in court and that uh, ended up in a very good result for for the people involved and even Benjamin um, um, produced a documentary on that case is called ayahuasca reframe that you you well you can find in our in our um, in our um, web page and, and networks social networks and from there, uh, and with the coming of, of the ayahuasca conference in 2014 in Ibiza, we organized a meeting with uh, experts and people working in, in, for one side, in drug policy reform and also in, in legal issues. So we organized this meeting uh, with lawyers from different parts of the world, with uh, drug policy experts from different parts of, of the world, and we we um, started to define a more, uh, let's say, professionalized uh, strategy to build uh, this uh, support service um, and to, to offer uh, the community options to be more protected in legal terms and, and to, 
to have or to be supported in the case of facing a, um, a legal incident. So I think, yeah, this is, I don't know, Andrea, if you would add uh, something like... Uh, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think maybe just to add it, that after my understanding after the the that 2014 World Ayahuasca Conference in Ibiza, one of the critical factors of getting the Ayahuasca Defense Fund started was that we launched a crowdfunding campaign. And the community basically backed the idea, backed the formation of the Ayahuasca Defense Fund and really supported us to continue to doing this work. So it's always been a program that has been community funded, which I think is, is really important. Um, so just welcome everyone who's just slowly joining us. I'm here with the members of the Ayahuasca Defense Fund team, and I'm Andrea Langlois from ICERS. Um, and I'm going to go next to Natalia. We're, we're going to go through a round of questions, and then we'll open to any questions you have around legal issues or legal incidents. I see some comments coming up already, so we will get to those after we just get a bit of details and overarching statements from our team to lay the groundwork for the conversation. Uh, so, Natalia, I know that you've been you've been a lawyer, one of the lawyers on the ground with the with the Ayahuasca Defense Fund for a number of years now. Can you describe a bit about what kind of supports um, the ADF provides to the community and a little bit about our criteria for accessing that support? Yes, and as you said, because the ADF is a community uh, kind of based uh, hub of information as well, and it's fine, you know, it's, it's the community who, who provides all the financial resources that we need to continue with our work. We always need to have a criteria to know who do we support. So in that sense, what we look at is the best practices of our practitioners in the first place. Like we want to make sure that what we're supporting are kind of the best practices on, or somehow like an umbrella of what are the persons that we are supporting, right? Uh, the second thing is integrity, looking at how the, the work goes on, uh, how they look at safety, uh, reciprocity, of course, giving back to the source, um, and, you know, kind of looking at the self-regulation. Um, we all know what the best practices are, um, so we kind of foster that, and we support those cases in particular. Um, the, the, the support that we've given in the past is always kind of sharing past sentences that we have, presidents, information, arguments as well. So we sometimes look at, you know, the national strategies. I must say that each country has different um, strategies that we look um, depending on the national framework and what are the components that we can play with. So sometimes it has to do with religious freedom. Sometimes it's another human rights, maybe cultural rights. Of uh, If it's an indigenous person, we look at indigenous rights um, and so on and so forth. So we kind of share these arguments and also we do share all the pharmacological arguments as well, which I must say are crucial um, for winning cases. Um, as Constanza, you know, pointed out, it's ayahuasca, it's not, it's not illegal under national or domestic legislation, but it is DMT what is no, normally scheduled. So we kind of look at uh, making a difference between um, the DMT that it's in the vegetal world and the DMT that is scheduled versus the, the scheduling of ayahuasca. Where, as we know, some countries have actually scheduled ayahuasca as a vegetal substance. So um, we share all this information and sometimes, uh, especially Constanza and, and Boso have gone to court as experts um, in doing some um, reports on, on, on this, on this issues, the legal part and the scientific aspect of, of ayahuasca. It's a great overview. Thank you, Natalia. I'm going to go over to Jesus now, who is uh, the newest member of our team. Unfortunately, we've seen a growth in the number of cases and had to expand our team. But unfortunately, we got Jesus uh, joining. And I'm just curious that since you've joined, what are your impressions of doing legal support on the ground with these kinds of cases? Well, thank you, Andrea. Uh, personally, I think it's uh, it's a it's a blessing to put my knowledge to the service of, of many of these uh, plants. Also, uh, I am deeply grateful to be in an organization that is completely aligned with debunking uh, some myths around many of the plants uh, that have psychoactive substances uh, through uh, legal uh, human rights, through scientific research. And, and I think that's something that I'm really proud of. So I know Times are, are a bit difficult right now with many cases going all, all around the globe, but um, I am, I'm deeply grateful to be part of this organization. 
And also, um, yeah, so now, and I, I'm, I know we're gonna get into the details afterwards, but, but for me right now, there's a current situation in Mexico, which compromises even me even more, right? Um, this, this, of course, uh, is, is something that, that we're working towards, uh, clarifying many of these of this, uh, misconceptions that many authorities have, not only in Mexico, but in the rest of the world. And, and I think part of the work that the ADF does is not only uh, providing legal counseling or legal support, but also being a little bit more proactive, right? Uh, having more proactive strategies in order to prevent any, any legal challenges that people who facilitate many of these medicines could face. So yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's an honor. Mm, thank you, Jesus. So Natalia, I know we probably get this question often. We're called the Ayahuasca Defense Fund, but our work goes beyond that. Can you maybe speak to, you know, what kinds of cases you see around different plant medicines? Yes, and this is also a thing that sometimes our community gets confused as it's, you know, the, the name is Ayahuasca Defense Fund. They tend to believe that we only um, defend cases related with ayahuasca. But as you said, it's, it's wider and it, it, it has to do with all plant medicines. But um, so, of course, the first plant that get, gets caught in the nets is ayahuasca. And the second place is um, coca leaf, then San Pedro and mushrooms. So the, in that order. Um, so we've defended, you know, a large amount of, ca of cases around these plants in general. Sometimes we get some cases with uh, the bufo alvarios and um, with iboga. But um, I would say those are the least. Great. So I'm gonna, we're going to pop up a, a map now so as people can see the cases that we've seen over the last year. Um, and maybe Jesus or Natalia, whichever you feel, would like to speak to this overview of the, the legal cases um, that we've seen in 2022. Yes, well, I, I just want to point out that um, normally in the past, we would see legal cases almost in Europe and in the U.S. So that is what would be like the Ayahuasca Defense Fund would be concentrated in these countries because, of course, the medicines would travel abroad and would be, you know, getting the cuts of prohibition, in the nets of prohibition in Europe in general. But recently, we've seen a trend, as you can see, um, in the Americas, um, not only in the United States, but also, as Jesus already pointed out, um, there's a huge amount of cases in Mexico at the moment, which is quite delicate. Then we've seen um, some incidents, not escalating to legal cases, but um, in Costa Rica. Then, of course, we've had recently uh, cases in Brazil related to the exportation of ayahuasca, um, Argentina with Bufo Alvarius, and then Chile. So now the ADF is working not only in Europe, but also um, working very hard in the Americas as well. Wow, those are some surprising trends. And how many cases, Natalia, has the ADF seen since it started? Well, until today, it's uh, 283 cases in 44 countries. So we also see how the, the ADF has been, you know, um, obliged to look into the broader scene worldwide and also thanks to the precedents that we've set in other countries, for example, in Europe, in particular in Spain, this kind of legal intelligence has helped to transfer all that knowledge and all the, the, the arguments that the judges have provided to share it with other jurisdictions. So it's, the, the ADF also plays an important role of sharing information, like a hub that reunites all the information around uh, plant medicines and then share to kind of shed light into other, other countries. Thank you. So we have a question in the chat around um, someone who's working with ayahuasca microdosing. Um, she says there's no DMT in the product, so I assume that would be vine only. So what kind of legal framework would you, or legal lens would you look at if somebody was working with vine only ayahuasca products, whether they should be concerned about any legal, potential legal reproduction? Well, I think the answer there would be um, first, where is this person based? Because as we know, if it's only, you know, the vine, then there's no DMT, which shouldn't be a problem. But as we know, ayahuasca, like the Cicotra Viridis Endebanisteropsis Capi, is scheduled in France and in Italy explicitly in the laws, um, and then in the Netherlands due to the Supreme Court resolution. So if you're not in those countries, um, I, I think my, my guess would be there should be no problem. Okay, 
Great. So I think one of the one of the pieces that's always struck me about the work that you're all doing is the emotional support. Um, and so, you know, having followed some of these cases, I know maybe Constanza, because you've been, you know, you've followed some of them for years. What what is it? What does the life look like for some of these folks who, even if they get off in the end from any legal charges, what what happens on the emotional level or on their personal lives when people have this experience of getting arrested or having legal charges because of their work with plant medicines or because of receiving a package? Hmm. Well, I have to say, um, <clears throat> with the with the yeah with the pass of the time, we, we we got more used to to support to provide this moral support to to people uh, reaching out to us. Um, that was a learning process for us as well because we at the very beginning we we, we tend to we tended to be very emotionally involved, and we realized that was probably not the best way to 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 offer the better the best support but um i have to say that in most cases uh especially at the beginning before the yeah the the, the before we witness witness the, the, this increase in 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 plant psychoactive plant related cases all over the world people was uh, was shocked at the beginning beginning because they they many of them didn't realize or didn't know they were uh, doing something that may involve uh, um, a legal problem. Uh, some of them has never been in touch with the criminal justice system at all. Not, not even in touch with any, I don't know, let's say any reflections about drug policies, drug laws, um, and, and criminal justice in in general. So um, one of the of the lessons we, we got from this uh, this first appreciation that that uh, I'm sharing is that uh, we needed to offer information, a lot of information to the community for people involved uh, uh, somehow with with the the, the use of, of plants. Uh, they realized that uh, they could face uh, a legal issues traveling with 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 plants or or doing any 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 yeah any activities in relations to it even if if uh, if sometimes they have a traditional connection with the plants the medicines even if they if they if they feel or felt they were protected by by the plan or the medicine, etc. So uh, this was, uh, yeah, like a very first lesson that we needed to share that uh, legal issues may ar ar arise. Um, also, it's uh, it's usually even in in for example in in the context of the Spain now more 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 focusing in in here in, in the context of the Spain even if if presidents were pretty successful in the sense that all the the cases we have supported have been acquittals and and no prison sentence was um was imposed we we what we saw as well is that the process of of navigating a legal process a criminal uh, process can be very hard in emotional terms in economical terms in social terms um terms so we have many dimensions that we have to to navigate even if the end of the process is a happy end that of course we don't know at the very beginning so that was um that was another another important uh lesson that uh, even if the result is is a good result the 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 path can be challenging as well so we we are um i mean I, I think we are we are really proud that one of the of the or oh, apart as a part of the service the services that we provide is this kind of 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 um of accompaniment with with the person with the people uh, doing this path and 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 
what we can feel is that they are very grateful because they found a space in, in which they can share, and Natalia and Jesus know this very well, now much better than I, that they they, they feel uh, understood, they feel supported, they feel they can uh, share their fears and their doubts and their hopes, etc., with with us, and they, they found this safe space. And I think that's also a, a very important contribution that uh, Jesus and Natalia do in, 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 their, in their daily work and their daily life. You can stand there. And yeah. Natalia and Jesus. Yeah. yeah, Jesus and Natalia, do you want to add to add to that what it feels like um, to offer that support? And so I think just to make it quite clear, like our lawyers don't go into court for people. You know, we're really supporting, gathering evidence that connects the dots between different legal cases, sometimes helping people find legal representatives in their given country, mm -hmm. and then offering this kind of accompaniment. So Jesus and Natalia, do you want to add to just what your experience has been just accompanying people through these legal processes? Yes, of well, course. Yeah. Natalia, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, so it's, it's always difficult with facing criminal law, right? Uh, when facing the possibility of being in prison. Uh, especially because of one's beliefs or one's practices. So uh, knowing that, it, it, uh, it makes us do that extra effort of being comprehensive, being supportive, not only as, as lawyers, because usually lawyers can be a bit cold, right? But also understanding that this practice is part of many people's beliefs, many people's uh, ways of healing. So uh, taking that into account, we have to be even more supportive, right? Uh, many of the people that have been involved in criminal issues, they're usually healers, they're usually people who help other people. So it's, it seems even more unjust to be involved in a criminal process, right? So um, having this in, in, in mind, we you try to provide uh, as much help as we can give. Uh, as you mentioned, we're not on the ground in, in every single country and sometimes legislation and legal frameworks can be quite difficult to get a hold on. Language barrier, of course, is is not uh, is is an issue, of course. So yeah, we try to uh, get in contact with local lawyers, um, see how they can assist, how they can help. Also, trying to explain many of the times to these lawyers that are not familiar with many of the plant medicines, what what are these uh, plants about? What is uh, the medicine that surrounds uh, many of these practices uh, around? And also. Um, tackling this myth that plants are fiscalized under international law or in, under local legislations. That, that is, of course, uh, uh, an interesting legal uh, topic, uh, but we, we have to go uh, beyond that, right? Because we're talking about people, we're talking about their liberty, we're talking about exercise of the freedoms and the rights. And, and I think that's where the ADF brings this extra component of having a humane touch throughout Thanks. all this process. Thanks, Susie. And Natalia. Yes, and, um, you know, as, as Constanza was saying, there's also like kind of a trauma of a person who's facing charges for the use of these plants. And, you know, there's an article in the, uh, in the Universal Declaration of Human, Right, Human Rights, which states that we have the freedom of religion, um, thought, and consciousness. Um, so there's also the religious aspect of all of this, as we all probably know, there are a lot of religions that have been recognized at the international level and in na national legislations as well. Um, and then they're, they're being arbitrarily considered as sects. So this profoundly violates this freedom of religion. So just, you know, it's not only the individual trauma, of course, of, you know, all of a sudden you're just, you know, in a criminal um, process, which is, you know, quite hard financially, emotionally, and all the family might get an impact on that. Um, but also there's a huge violation to the, the freedom of religion, thought and consciousness. So um, it's quite hard, you know, just, you know, the idea of walks hand by hand also with the aspect of um, kind of protecting the human rights that uh, involve the, the use of these plants. Okay, that segues well to one of the can questions. I add, can yeah. I add something to that? Yeah, it just came to my mind that, yeah, I, I agree with Jesus and Natalia that one of the, of, of, and one of the learnings that we 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 got during this this process of ADF was that uh, we were not facing a just 
let's say, just a drug uh, case or a criminal case, but uh, it was uh, more, uh, I mean, it was the dimension of the issues we were dealing with uh, were related to, to many, uh, in many ways with human rights. And, and especially with, with the sector of human rights, it is economic, uh, social, and cultural rights. And just to bring an example uh, to you, uh, the, the, the coca leaf cases that we, we face, many, I would say, like, I don't know, 90% of them uh, are uh, happens here in, in, in Spain. And they involved uh, people from the Andean communities, uh, but living in Spain, and they want to continue the, the, their social use of, of coca leaf. And in many cases, they bring the, the, the plant with them because, yeah, ma many times it, they don't even conceive that this is a, a prohibited plant or a prohibited uh, um, um, use here because uh, from, from the countries they come from, it's it's so common, it's so uh, normalized. I mean, it's legal, it's normalized, and it's, 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 it's an important uh, part of social life. So, for example, uh, one of the arguments that we are bringing and we, 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 we developed uh, with time um, in a more sophisticated way was the, 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 the cultural right to, to use uh, a plan that you socially use in your, in your home country or in your, in your home uh, society. So this is just one example of how, how we yeah, we realized that uh, we needed to 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 bring these cases uh, beyond uh, a drug or criminal drug case, and and to move uh, or to push them in in a in a broader uh, scenario, uh, incorporating uh, many different angles uh, of of uh, the econ so economic, social, and, and cultural rights. I think that addresses the question we had in the chat. Maybe I don't know if there's anything else to add about whether or not using an international human rights or cognitive liberty liberty framework, if that is getting any traction. Is there any more you might want to say in terms of that? I know both Jesus and Natalia, your your lawyers focusing specifically on on human rights. Uh, maybe starting with Jesus. Yes. So it 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 really. It's, it, it's complicated because each country has its way of interpreting international human rights conventions. Uh, this should not be the case, but unfortunately it is. Also legislations vary a lot in each country, in each region. Uh, we see that specifically in Northern America, there is uh, quite a protection under freedom or religious acts. Uh, but this is not the case in the rest of, of the countries, right? They don't have that strong uh, freedom of uh, consciousness and religion. Uh, and so even though the international framework is usually um, approved by many of the states, they do differ in how they interpret them locally. And, and that is a challenge. Even though internationally there is an interpretation and there is uh, an understanding of how these rights are protected and how they're developed, locally is where we face strong challenges. Right, uh, this margin of appreciation that the European Human Rights Court applies, well, it, it is it is in a sense an, an issue when um, discussing or when facing legal challenges locally. So, yeah, I think that that would be one part of the problem of of the international conventions applying it locally. Oh yeah, um, add anything. Yeah, well, just, you know, just adding that these tensions that we see with the drug control framework and the human rights framework, it's not a tension that only happens at the domestic level, but we see this also at the international level. So we see all the agencies of the United Nations of uh, drug control that are in Vienna um, that are, you know, totally going towards a more prohibitionist strategy. And then we see all these agencies that sit in Geneva that have to do with human rights going towards decriminalization um, and allowing the, the personal use, for example, or in the case for the indigenous persons, of course, reinforcing the rights that they have under the a lot of international instruments like the ILO 169 convention. 
Um, and we see this two United Nations bodies being um, in constant tension and not having a dialogue at all. So the kind of this international uh, framework that is not communicating is somehow, you know, coming into the ground at the domestic level. So it's through the, the human rights, actually, and the prioritization of human rights over drug control policies that we've been, you know, been, been able to set precedents in this sense. Um, so I think this will be kind of looking into the future is how the domestic judges will resolve these tensions that are crystallizing in the domestic level as well. Thank you, Natalia. I think mentioning indigenous rights is quite important because we know a lot of these cases are about medicines traveling out from inside their countries of origin to other countries. So, you know, that while there are a lot of people that are, are not, you know, coming from traditional communities of that use, we do have cases within the ADF where indigenous people are being caught carrying the medicines of their peoples. Um, are there any cases, not knowing that, knowing that we can't get into specifics, but what kind of trends, what are we seeing in this regard um, that, that may be good to share with the international community? Well, I would say that at the moment we're facing one of the most delicate moments at the with the ADF because we have four persons arrested in Mexico that are indigenous persons. They have self-determined as indigenous, um, and this is quite a you know a huge violation to human rights and also constitutional law in Mexico, uh, because as we know, as indigenous, they have special rights to the to the psychoactive plants and ancestral use of, of, of these plants. So it's not only under the domestic level, but this is totally um, recognized at the international level as well. So whenever it's an indigenous person who's being detained, there's special protection that needs to be given through all the process, like special translation. Um, there needs to be like a, also a cultural translation of the process and so on and so forth. And we, we're not seeing this. Um, so it's right now it's one of the most challenging moment of um, indigenous persons being, you know, in, in accused of drug trafficking. And do we have a sense of why this sudden flux of cases in Mexico? Is there an understanding of what's happening there? Well, I don't know if Jesus, you want to answer that? <laughs> well, I think, I think it, it comes from a, a long list of things that are not functioning correctly in the local legal system. Um, these cases particularly are difficult because there is a, a figure of a preventive prison that is enforced mm -hmm. directly when we're discussing or we're talking about um, health issues, health um, uh, criminal crimes that, that are placed under this category. Um, I, I think that it's uh, it's mistaken by the authorities. They, what they portray or what they they exhibit is that they're unaware of how many of these communities, many of these indigenous uh, peoples have used this plant medicine. And we see it also uh, in the le local legislation. Mexico has one of the, uh, I would say, harshest legislations on this matter in the world. Uh, unlike many other countries, Mexico, even though they have a strong and uh, historical use, uh, the use of peyote and the use of, sh of mushrooms in particular, they are categorized as illegal in Mexico. There is a, an exemption for uh, indigenous communities, but this exemption is just that they will not be prosecuted, but this does not mean that it's not a crime. So I think uh, this, this presses on the issue that uh, we need to continue to inform, to provide evidence, to provide information to authorities to understand what they're talking about when they uh, put the, this, this, um, this category under many of the plant medicines. Mm. Do you want to add anything, Natalia or Constanza? Good. Um, we have a question also from somebody in the chat who says that they are uh, an attorney retiring soon and they want to know how to help. Um, how are lawyers from around the world incorporated into the work that we do and what are the opportunities? Mm, well, we please email us <laughs> so we can explain everything in, in, in depth. Um, yeah, we have a, a, a network of, of lawyers uh, of lawyers and in different countries. So what uh, one of the first things we usually do when we, we receive a, 
a request from someone demanding um, legal support is, well, we ask if, do you have a lawyer already? Because that's the very first uh, question that we we post. And, and if uh, the person doesn't have a lawyer, we, we connect uh, her or him with with uh, with a local lawyer um, that has some expertise in in the matter. If possible, we we don't have contacts lawyers uh, uh, contacts in in every country in the world, but in many many I have to say, and even in different parts of of within um, the same country. So our network net, network is getting. Uh, uh, bigger so yes please email us and 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 we can yeah, explain um how to yeah to be in touch and and to have your contact basically so we can transfer um if a case uh, in your jurisdictions uh, comes to us we we can um, yeah, be in touch and and try to, to work together i don't know yeah, if you want right. to add something yeah. i i don't i don't have the number of of I mean the the, the, the number of, of lawyers that we we have in our database. It's uh, it's not like let's say it's not a formal network, but we have uh, for us the work with with lawyer has also been an important part of of the of the strategy. Let's say because we 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 try to bring them together to discuss to you know to make them explain the situation in their own countries and and <clears throat> and to develop common strategies uh, to provide support to each other um etc so that's also an important part of of our work the work um yeah the, the education this is a, an important word in 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 the title of of ICRs. And so from our side, we try to provide these um, educations to, to lawyers, to um, prosecutors, to judges, the, the, well, the best we, 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 we can in, in terms of approaching these people. It's not always easy and they, they tend to be very, um, let's say, very um, strict in their consideration of, of this type of cases so but uh, with lawyers we have been more successful so we have to say yeah thank you constanza and i think you know it's yes. the, the the this project is really it's a community effort you know it's taken a lot of different lawyers who work with us people who spread the word and also it's you know it's been through community funding that we've been able to do this you know we've done two successful crowdfunders but just spreading the word, you know, often the, the people who are facing, you know, legal challenges, you know, they might have to be paying legal costs, you know, they might not be able to have their own livelihood. So it's not, you know, we don't ask people for a fee. And so if you can, or if you know anyone who can to actually financially support the ADF, a monthly donation is a great way to go. Um, and then we can just really continue the work and cont continue supporting folks. And then your community of practitioners knows that we're there for them if they have any troubles. Um, so I think, you know, really finding a way to donate if you can is, is a great way to support the program. Which leads me to another question. If somebody knows somebody knows somebody who suddenly finds themselves in a legal situation, um, what, what, what should they do? What's the first step that's most important that people do if they find themselves, let's say, let's go to the package situation, because I think it's much more common that people have a package intercepted of medicine or receiving a package. What does that look like for people when that happens? What can they do? Well, I think the first step um, is first knowing what is the legal framework in your country. Like the best way to attend a legal case is preventing one, for sure. So I think um, just being mindful that it is not maybe safe. It might be legal, but still not very safe. So I would, I would just invite everyone to know and educate themselves first on is it legal? Why? Is it illegal? Then why? Um, so just attending the whys and, you know, just knowing the, the, the legislation is something that can really um, help with the legal harm reduction. And then, of course, the second step is always um, sending an email to law at ICA.org where we can actually connect to some lawyers that have, you know, uh, know about all these incidents. And they do have a lot of experience in the past. They, so they literally know the arguments already. So we don't want to lose time. 
So at the beginning, like the first hours of a person being arrested, for example, are crucial. Um, the judge normally has, depending where, but normally up, up, up until 48 hours to determine if there's elements to consider there's a felony. So I think this first hours are crucial. Um, so normally, as Constanza said, we do have a database of national lawyers who you know, we've worked with in the past. So, um, you know, it's touching base with, with us. It could be even before. And we can just, you know, give the contact of a lawyer before anything happens. Uh, but just you know, as Constanza also mentioned, education is um, the first element to a legal case. And then, of course, just we, we are always there to, to help and to kind of provide all the expertise that we have in the field. What happens when people are traveling with medicine or making that choice? What kind of, what kind of um, cases do we see that involve um, flights and traveling with medicine or borders? Um, so maybe you want to speak to that question. Yes, yeah, so uh, unfortunately we've seen an increased number of uh, people being detained or arrested in, uh, in borders, particularly airports, bringing their, their uh, medicines. Uh, and usually this, this is because some of the uh, samples that the authorities use are not completely precise. So sometimes we've seen cases when, where people bring, for instance, peyote and the, um, the results from, uh, from customs turns out to be MDMA, right? So mm -hmm. this, is, this is, of course, not precise. And that can lead to investigations to imprisonment and so we for, for once uh, talk to authorities you know, to to help them create a more precise uh, way to uh, measure many of the substances uh, also be in contact with authorities to let them know that many of these substances are not scheduled they're not fiscalized and mm -hmm. and and finally just be uh, the, the person who brings this, I think they have to be uh, mindful that they can't, they, it's a possibility that they can get into trouble because of this. Um, mm -hmm. Fortunately, many of the cases just last until the investigation. Uh, we usually mm -hmm. don't see them go above or beyond that, but we have recently seen more cases where, where, this, where this has not happened, where, where mm -hmm. we've seen people being arrested. So. Just be mindful of that. So we do have a question. I'm not sure if we have the answer to it. Out of the, I think it's 283 or four cases we've seen over the last number of years, do we have, you know, exact statistics on how many of those resulted in acquittals and how many resulted in convictions? Yes. Well, first of all, I just want to, you know, point out that out of the 283 cases that we've supported, it's also kind of legal challenges because sometimes, as I said, like the first hours are, are super important to determine if there's a felony or not. So I, I would say there's 283 legal challenges. Some of them just escalate into a formal legal case. This means there's a prosecution and there's kind of formal charges being um, in the process. So that's the, the main difference, right? So fortunately, not all of the legal challenges escalate up to a formal legal case. Um, so I would say that not all of them, you know, have had a trial and a process. Um, but from those of them who have escalated into a legal case, formally speaking, um, we've seen different results. So sometimes we've seen, as Constanza mentioned, there's a lot of acquittal, acquittal. Then, of course, we see uh, recognition of ayahuasca or whatever the medicine is involved, um, not being a scheduled substance under national law. So we see also that. Then we see, for example, in the U.S., it's very common that judges don't want to have a stance on the legality of ayahuasca. So they normally just kind of, you know, do a probation or community service, or sometimes it's a fine. They won't go to, the, to study the legality of ayahuasca, for example. So the results vary depending on each country. Um, of course, in, in, in Spain, for example, we've seen, you know, a lot of... Um, not just recognizing that I'm not legal, um, but it's kind of ambivalent depending on each country. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So yeah, when people see, I think the, the when we say legal incidents, we don't necessarily mean a case that's gone through the, the court system. So there's a couple of clarifying questions. So someone just wanted to make, be sure that they understood that there are four cases currently in Mexico. 
Is that, is that? Well, it's well, four cases that involve indigenous persons, but there's also other four persons that are not indigenous that are also okay. detained at the moment. So, it, so it there's sounds eight like people that have been detained. It's actually nine. It's actually nine, but only four are indigenous. Oh, okay. Someone else is asking about the two recent uh, arrests in Spain. Um, so I don't know if you want to speak to these two cases, one in particular where there were, um, you know, quite a number of police officers sent to, to make an arrest and just what, maybe what those two cases that have become quite high profile in Spain, what can we learn about what, what is currently becoming a bit of an issue in Spain? Constanza, do you want to speak to that? Do you feel familiar? Yeah, well, we, we don't um, we don't have uh, many details about the evolution, the current uh, situation and evolution of, of these cases. But um, from what we have seen, I think the situation is quite uh, worrying because it shows, um, first of all, I think it shows a, a, a lack of, of understanding of, of from the Spanish authorities and especially the Spanish uh, police uh, about uh, well, which is the the the, the background and, and the context of of, of uh, traditional uh, plants uh, use and um, and and also about the legality of, of these plants. So um, and I think as Natalia mentioned uh, uh, right before, uh, it's a bit. Um, also, it's a bit uh, a lack of understanding the connection with with uh, with cults and and the connections with with uh, this. Uh, I think this sensationalistic way of looking at what we don't understand, what we don't we, we don't uh, we don't know. Um, I have to say, uh, this is a trend we are seeing all over Europe. It's, it started uh, in France a while ago, but uh, this year Italy also scheduled ayahuasca and, and all the plants used to, to um, yeah, in the in the decoction of of ayahuasca. So uh, I think it's it's worrying because as as. As authority, we have several uh, ways of approaching an issue we don't understand, and we 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 have doubts about the the the, the implications for public health or public security. So we can uh, we can opt for establishing a dialogue with 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 the people involved and and mm -hmm. try to to learn about uh, the phenomenon and try to to focus on on risk reduction and and. And to focus on on how can we uh, approach from from a political uh, framework, from a legal framework, from a social framework, a response as a community to to what uh, we 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 see being an emerging um, public security or public health issue, mm -hmm. or or taking this other option of, of not asking and, and going in this type of, of, of um, sensationalistic rights where, where um, well, from my point of view, and, and perhaps this is something shared from, from also by, by you, uh, it's uh, very disproportionate. So no matter what the, the end of of, of, of the conclusion of these cases, the, 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 the way of, of acting was was very disproportionate. And I have to say this is very common in, in, in many uh, uh, drug cases. So it's, uh, it shows like um, that uh, we need to learn a lot as society, as community. Uh, we need to, to learn a lot on how to, well, what type of response we, we provide to, to our well, things that happens in, in our communities. Okay. Thank you, Constanza. Um, I'm just going to go to the last, there's a couple of little small questions coming through and then we'll, we'll hear from each of our amazing panelists and then we'll wrap up for today. So there was another question, just um, I think these two cases in Spain, or at least one of them was the case where people were gathering um, and there was, there was an arrest, but how many, 
have there been any cases that involve retreat centers or how many cases actually that we know of um, are coming um, where there's a police in interaction when people are actually going to a ceremony in a physical space? Do you have a sense of that maybe Natalia? Um, yes, well, we've, you know, we've seen normally what the, the, the main incidents that we've supported have to do, as we said, with the importation. Uh, it's a person traveling with the medicine into the airport, then it's been tested, and then, you know, there's prosecution or not. Then there's the option of another person receiving a package home, and then it's sometimes a controlled um, delivery of the package with the police. And then, of course, we've seen this... Um, this new situation where ceremonies are being also being somehow, um, you know, getting caught in, 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 in the prohibitionist approach. Um, so this is one of the parts which I think it's um, more delicate, of course, because it's, you know, as uh, the, the persons who are there are also practicing the freedom of religion. And then um, well, this, this talks about how states are also implementing a more prohibitionist approach rather than just focusing on um, the, the plant medicines, they're also looking into um, this sect argument. So this is one of the most argument, I mean, most delicate things that we've also seen in the ADF. So this is why we were also, you know, we started um, saying that the ADF is at the moment facing one of the most challenges, challenging episodes of, of our program due to, you know, the, the, the need of just having an approach to each situation which needs to be approached in a different way. Um, so I just also want to just say to, to kind of finish that the ADF would kind of all, always worked in towards the legal cases, but we've also started with a proactive approach, not, let's not wait to a legal incident to happen. So let's work beforehand. Um, so this is, you know, we've, we've done a lot of efforts in different countries and kind of gathering the community, having a lawyer in charge. Um, helping the lawyer to understand the arguments, the scientific aspect, um, sharing all the sentences and precedents that we've said in the past, and so on and so forth. So I think that also is a lesson to us, and it should be for our community, is to start a proactive work before something happens. Um, and this is something that we cannot do by ourselves at the ADF, but we also need to work hand by hand with the community. So this is also kind of an invitation um, to all our facilitators and you know the community in, in each country to get together, and we're, we're more than happy to educate you know the lawyers as well and kind of form um, a national organism that can actually you know um, start educating the authorities as well. So this is a calling to also work internationally, locally, and globally to face the situation because that would also make that the ADF can actually work proactively more easily than just, you know, attending legal incidents. Great. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, there's a team within ICERS that does work with practitioners on the ground in several countries. So I think we know it's such a jurisdictional, regional, regional focus. Everything is different where everybody is and speaking with each other and working with your community is really important. Um, so be before we close, I just want to hear from each of you. Um, those who know me know I love thinking about a brighter future. And so I'm just curious if you had, you know, one desire for the year that is coming um, or the, the work ahead for, for this legal work, you know, what would that be? How could you envision things looking differently? Um, and I'll start with Constanza. Mm, well, I think um, as Natalia, I, I, yeah, and as Natalia said that uh, we, we, probably we will need to focus on or put more more energy on the on the proactive strategies especially when when developments like uh, the one in happening in Italy or now in Spain with all these raids or yeah um also France so we we yeah we need to we need to to focus yeah, on proactive uh, and educational and and risk reduction uh, strategies and 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 to deep uh, deepen the, the dialogue with with authorities. And this is yeah, this is of course I, I don't know, but perhaps I was just an idea that came to my mind. We were perhaps we were 
in the global and in a global level, not not specifically for Spain, but in 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 the global level, we were very op optimistic about uh, the the the. We were very optimistic uh, about the, the the future of 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 uh, of the legal futures of of psychoactive plants because we were listening this uh, uh, wave of cannabis regulation all over the world, um, but next or or very soon what we we also saw it's that cannabis regulation is is very um compatible with uh, very repressive drug policies in other areas so perhaps we will be facing a very complicated scenario in which cannabis is uh, legality is more and more open and 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 traditional plants are getting more and more restricted so this is uh, this is something that we need to i mean this is a balance that we need to 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 fight somehow i mean we, we need to 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 work on 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 yeah on on more creative creative responses from 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 the society from civil society as we are part of um, and also to 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 establish the dialogues with the different stakeholders to yeah to be able to promote other responses Constanza and Jesus, what would you? Um, I know you're new. You're newer to the team, but I can tell you're a big dreamer. So, what what would you like yes. to see for the future? Uh, well, I would like to see a lot of things, but I think the first the first one, and I think the most important one, has to do with the community. Um, I think as many of these plant medicines are becoming increasingly popular or accessible to many many people around the globe. We need to be, first of all, conscious of the communities where these plants come from. Uh, we've seen a trend uh, regarding, you know, trying to generate patents uh, around many of these plant medicines. I think that's something as a community, we need to be really respectful of indigenous knowledge and their systems and their ecosystems. Um, I also believe that uh, we have these, the situation that's going on uh, around Europe and around the globe, um, criminalizing many of these practices. Uh, we mentioned this, the cases in, in Spain, but we've also seen cases uh, around raids in Italy and, and, and in other places. Um, I think that that is also uh, a wake up call for our community to have more ethical and more responsible practices. Uh, at the end of the day, these, uh, um, practices are our presentation towards uh, the authorities, stakeholders. So we have to be really responsible on that. And I think in 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 that sense, when when we do have this sense of community, a sense of responsibility, we're going to have a stronger stance against governments placing many of these restrictions on plant medicine. Thank you, thank you so much, Jesus and Natalia. What's your vision? Well, I think that um, there's a calling, a um, collective calling, which is that we need to be activists for, for what we stand for. What do we stand for? Um, and I think that it's also a great opportunity, you know, that we've, we've seen there's a lot of, you know, challenges right now, legal challenges in different parts of the world. But that's also an opportunity to kind of coming together, looking into what are the practices that we are sharing like what's the best practices that we can envision together and we need to stand strictly together on that so that's a calling for the best practices also and um very important reciprocity so we see there's a you know the western world finding a lot of healing and kind of solutions in the use of this ancestral plants which are a gift but of course we are obliged to preserve the amazon region in particular um mm -hmm. in each of course each plant has its own bioculture um, but but speaking specifically about ayahuasca, it's not only I, I want to facilitate it, do not want to have a, a legal challenge. It's what are you giving back to the source? Mm -hmm. um, it's very delicate what's going on. So I think it's an, a calling for activism, but that involves reciprocity, integrating the practices that we are um, that we are you know sharing. And of course, I think the the ideal model is self regulation. So we don't want the government to come and tell us how to regulate, but we need to self-regulate as a community. So it's also a calling 
for being activists of the of our own circles, of our own communities, and sharing those practices with other countries. It can inspire to have the best practices and you know bringing the reforestation that needs to be brought to the Amazon region. Mm. Thank you, Natalia. I think that's a great place to end that, you know, we talked about human rights, but rights come with responsibilities, mm -hmm. responsibilities to acknowledge the sources of these medicines, to uphold the rights of the people and the places and the territories where they're coming from, to not deplete the plant medicines, fungi, cacti, toad, you know, for use in other places without really considering that. So, you know, the, the ADF is really as I see it, it's one prong in a multi-pronged approach that comes out of ICERS. And I, I really thank everybody for coming here today. Thank Natalia, you know, you're calling to be activists. So, you know, we also need to just call on the community to support the work that we're doing. If you're able to, um, please contribute to our work or share the word that, you know, we're able to do this work because of donations from the communities. And um, we're really happy to be here to answer your questions today. So stay, you know, stay healthy, stay safe, and please stay in touch. Uh, thank you, Constanza, Natalia, Jesus, for your incredible work supporting the community and to everyone for being here with us today and farewell thank you everyone bye and thank you sarah <laughs>